All right, all right, all right. Welcome, boys and girls, to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. I am Vince Daddario. That guy right there is Brian Driscoll. He's the publisher at irishbreakdown.com. I'm the football analyst. Forgot to mention that. And it's all good. It's all good. You know, titles. Whatever. They know who you are. Yeah, exactly. Um, but we're back, and uh, we've got a fun one today. And Notre Dame has obviously uh, they got a new head coach. They've had to hire multiple assistant coaches. And, you know, Brian and I have been going back and forth for, well, let's be honest, years about some of the faults of some of the coaches that were here. And now that there are replacements for those coaches, what do they need to do walking in the door? Yeah. Line? And in a couple instances, you're talking about a coach who's done a good job. For example, Mike Elston replacing Absolutely. Mike Elston. That's a coach who's done a good job. Absolutely. That they're going to have to replace. And so, you know, look, <coughs> excuse me, um, the got a little bit of bronchitis. The The big task in front of the offensive coaches, I think, is really where a lot of this conversation is going to go. And the, the, the exciting thing about what's going on right now at Notre Dame is it's kind of like, you know, we've been making a lot of bold statements about what's been holding Notre Dame back, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, over the next couple of years, we're going to find out whether we were right or not, or we were wrong. That's you know? a very and, good point. And, and so we're going to discuss some of the tasks that are in front of the coaches that are going to tell us, okay, are these guys, was it, was it a player problem? Was it a Notre Dame problem? Was it an assistant coach problem? Was it a Brian Kelly problem? Was it a little bit of, you know, multiple things? We're going to find all that out, right? And over yeah. the next year. And so that, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of where I, where I want to, where, where we're kind of going to go with this is what do these coaches need to do in order to fix some of the things sure. that were a problem? And in some instances, you know, a position was good or strong, like the D line, but there's some areas where they've got to uh, do an even better job of getting these guys ready, or, you know, some guys are gone and you've got to do some replacements and those kind of things. So it's, it's kind of all over the place and there's different types of things, but the goal being the end game being the things we're going to discuss today are going to be the things that are going to determine whether or not Notre Dame is able to, to take this thing to the next level, right? Which is ultimately the goal. That's the yeah, lens absolutely. through which we look at everything. Now, is this something that gets you closer to competing for and winning a championship? Yep. And, and I think some of the hires that were made this off season are worst steps in that direction. And sure. so now we're going to kind of get into the details of what that's going to look like. This, this is very, this is an interesting time for Notre Dame football and for Irish breakdown for that matter, because we have called for certain things to happen, mm -hmm. and now they're hap they've happened, and so it's like, a, okay, this is what you wanted. Let you know, let, mm -hmm. let, let's see if you're right or not. You know what I mean? And and I'm not saying that I don't think we're we're going to be right in a lot of areas, but this is where the rubber meets the road, and it and it's like, okay, you got what you wanted. Yeah. Now, let, it, well, I have no doubt that we were right. It's it's will these coaches do the things necessary to right. fix it? Absolutely. Okay. You know, so let's, let's jump right in. We're going to go coach by coach. Uh, let's start out with the, uh, the most tenured coach. Sure. Uh, well, this is the one that we've, I mean, we have, I mean, there's not a position group on this football team. We've talked more about the last two, three, no four years than the offensive line. Right. And that's kind of, that's where we yes. got to be. So we're, we're going to start know? with Harry. He stand. He was officially announced. What was it yesterday, Brian? Uh, mm -hmm. but this is the, <laughs> what felt like the longest time period between knowing he was coming back and him officially being announced. Um, uh, but Harry, he is announced as the offensive line coach. So walking in the door, we know that he hit the ground running recruiting. And I, I want to put this out there as well. We're not necessarily going to talk about what these coaches, we're not going to talk about recruiting. anything about recruiting. Right. This is going to be a, this is a focusing on the team. Right. What's on the roster standpoint. right now. We'll have and, that show later when you know because we actually have you know recruiting dedicated I was gonna say, shows now there, so. there may be a different guy in my seat when that conversation <clears throat> you know. takes place you know what i mean but uh yeah. or brian and i might switch spots for that show you never know um but anyway so harry he stand what does he need to do with the current roster was there 17 offensive linemen i think is what you said earlier yeah is 17 right? i don't expect it to be quite that i think at least okay. one coach is or one player i don't expect john dirksen back okay but other than that, I mean, it's a it's a lot of players now. Yes, it is. Ten of them are 
freshmen and sophomores, right? Incoming freshmen and rising sophomores. So it, it this is actually going to be somewhat of a young group, not yeah. like last year's, <laughs> uh, but it's going to have more experience, playing experience right. than maybe what we saw last year. Right. So, uh, so that'll so be a positive. The number one thing, and you and I both had it on our, because you made a list, I made a list, we kind of compared lists. The number one thing on both of our lists is you you need to instill physicality yeah. back into this position group. And it, it's I, I wrote down rebuild the fight. You wrote down instill physicality, both meaning the exact same thing. I mean, that's by far the number one thing that needs to happen with this group. They, and, they were and, just too passive. And this is an issue. This has been an issue three of the last four years. Right. Right. The one exception being, and I, I think we need to talk about something else, not just Harry Heastand. It's not just Harry Heastand's coming back to Notre That's Dame. It's also point. Chris Watt. Right. Chris Watt. They're not going to announce the hire. That's what I was told, that they're okay. not going to announce Chris Watt because they only announce, you know, full-time like coaches, assistant. basically. Yeah, right. So, which I, I'm sorry. When an alum comes back to work for yeah. you in the capacity, it should be celebrated. Missed opportunity, but Absolutely. whatever. Is he official? Uh, like, is he back on campus? Yeah, he's like, already back in South okay. Bend. And, okay. and now, again, is it official in that all the paperwork is signed and all that other stuff? I don't know, but I know right. he's back in South Bend. Okay. He's been for over, all I like, need. a week, and it's it's good to go. It's all I need. So the lack of toughness, the lack, and, and not mm-hmm. even toughness, because I don't think the linemen under Jeff Quinn lacked toughness. They didn't lack the desire to compete. Sure. Jeff Quinn never put a line out there that didn't want to be physical. They just weren't taught how to be physical. So I, I don't want to start, like, now that he's gone, start taking cheap shots at Jeff Quinn. His guys didn't lack toughness. They lacked the tools to go play physical football. Three out of the four years, the one exception being 2020 when they had a line dominated by Harry Heastan's recruits and guys that were coached by Harry Heastan. And they had Chris Watt, who you talk to any of the players on that team, they'll tell you Chris Watt had a big role. Uh, on, oh, yeah. on that football team. I mean, oh, yeah. there, there's not anyone that's actually around the program that says otherwise. There's fans on message boards that have no knowledge of the situation whatsoever that like having dumb takes that will say Chris Watt was a GA. He didn't have an impact. Ignoring the fact that Tommy Reese was the quarterback's coach in 2017 as, as a, GA. a GA. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. You know, but uh, you know, <clears throat> ask anyone that actually played on the team, he had a big role in what they did in 2020. And he is now back in, an, in a different role than he had in 2020. But having those two guys back, because now Harry Heastan has someone that he can say, hey, look, I'm going to be over here doing this, and I need you to get in the film room and do this with these kids. Because analysts can be can be involved off the field in everything. Right. They just can't be coaching on the field. That's where they can't, which I think is kind of a dumb rule, but whatever. It is what it is. Yeah, exactly. So when when you look at, this whole thing it's it's the first step the the most important step and the first two kind of go hand in hand but the most first step first step is it's a mentality thing that's why we went this direction more so than the other it's a mentality thing like you have to have a deep burning desire to physically whoop the man across from you yes and i don't think that's an area where jeff quinn thrived enough right it's not that he didn't value it it's not that his players were soft it wasn't anything like that there just wasn't a and enough of an emphasis on you are out there in a street fight. That's what line play is. It's like a street fight. Every and down, every it's, play. It's, you've got to be willing to battle and scrap and fight and claw for every inch. And then the second part of it, and I'm going to kind of tie these together, is you got to get back to playing the game the right way. And, and, and there are two points, but they have to be talked about as one because wanting to be tough and physical – is part mindset and part being taught how to properly be physical. Because if you just go out there and just like, I want to fight and scrap and claw, and then you just like head down, right, miss, sack, you know? I mean, it's about how to play that way. What is the proper technique necessary to go out and play the game with phys- you know, with physicality, but also understand that there's a method, there's got to be a method to the madness, so to speak, right? And I think that's the biggest thing that was missing from this football team. And, you know, we talked about things like, you know, they would catch, right? Well, that's a technical problem. You guys saw it, you know, last season, as more and more people started to watch the offensive line play, you'd see them pick one foot up, pick one foot down, pick the other foot up, pick, pick, put it down, and then just kind of absorb contact. Right. That's a technical problem. That's not a lack of toughness. If anything, 
it takes more toughness to sit there and wait on a guy to just come at you. It. Just than take it, it. You know, so yeah. it's about physicality, not toughness. I will never question the toughness of the Notre Dame offensive line in the last four years. They were willing to battle. They just weren't taught how to battle, right, properly. And so it's stepping with power, bringing that, that back foot kind of with you to kind of get your hips to drive forward and then coming with power and striking through force and kind of punching through the defender – you know, then driving your feet through contact. All those things are are technical things that they weren't taught. And the reason I can say that confidently is because when all five guys are consistently not doing it, right, they're, they're all doing all the same dumb thing. Yeah. or you're not teaching it. And we all know they're not dumb. The Notre Dame players are not dumb. So <clears throat> clearly they're not being taught the way to take what you're seeing right. in practice and translate it onto the football field. Right. And, and that was an issue in 2018 to a degree, but you were still kind of benefiting from the Harry Heastan effect in 2018. 2019, they took a big step back in that regards. 2020, step back up for the reasons that we mentioned. And then what we said before the season was, this was a big year for Jeff Quinn yep. because this is the first year he's not coaching a bunch of Harry Heastan guys. And he's you didn't have, have one a Harry disciple, Heastan. Right. You didn't have a Harry Heastan disciple at GA as well. And he, it was, and and I don't want to blame. I've heard the the new GA is a good coach and all those kind of things, but he didn't have Harry Heastan work right. with him on a daily basis. But the point is, you had four starting linemen that were never coached by Harry Heastan ever, and we saw the worst offensive line play of uh, in a long time at yeah. Notre Dame. Yeah, and it's it's not it's not a coincidence. That's what our fear was coming into the season, and it's because. They weren't taught how to play. There weren't the veterans on the team that did learn under Harry Heastan that could set the example for the younger players anymore. And, and so those are the things that, like, you know, we had story after story about it was Alex Bars in 2018. It was Robert Hainsey in 2019. It was Chris Watt in 2020. The Harry Heastan pipeline that was able to kind of step into that vacuum and say, hey, yeah, I know we're not being taught this, but we need to do this. And they were able to try, at least in some regards, to overcome it. And this year, there just wasn't that anymore. And so to me, instilling physicality has to be coupled with getting back to playing the game the right way. And and technique and footwork and all those things are impeccable. Then they have to be they have to be a big part of who you are and a big part of of you know, this is this is if you want to be great, this is what's needed. And I think those, to me, are the, – that's the foundation of right. what is right. needed when it comes to offensive line play at Notre Dame. Yeah, no, could not agree more. I, I had rebuild the fight, and I had fundamentals. And that's – again, those are two very similar ways to look at what needs to happen with this offensive line. And I, I have faith that that is going to happen because those were like the calling cards of, of a Harry Heastan coached offensive line. I mean, you could always count on – these guys are going to be fundamentally sound and they were going to take the fight to the defense. And right. so I'm excited about what I think those two things can happen. Now that, mm -hmm. Those aren't big questions for me, but that's the charge. I mean, that's what needs to take place from Harry Heastan and Chris Watt moving forward. Now, some specifics as to uh, what he needs to do more from a personnel standpoint, right? Um, I think a big question mark is, how is Blake Fisher going to take the Harry Heastan coaching, right? Yeah, and I mean, that wasn't really where I was going with it. Okay. Um, with that one, it was, I, I, and we have a super chat that kind of addresses that. Maybe we'll get to that afterwards. When I, when I look at the important task for Blake Fisher, it's more about, you know, the task for Harry Heastan is you've got to, you, you look, to, you don't need stars on right. your offensive line. You give me five good players, and you're going to have a really good offensive line. We've said this before. Give me If you have two stars and three not good players, and they don't play well together, you're not going to have a great offensive line. You give me five really good players, no great players, and they know how to play together, you're going to have a great offensive line. Sure. However, as we saw in 2015, as we saw in 2017, when you have five guys that play together and you have stars on your <laughs> team, you're going to be really good. That's when it gets to elite status. Yeah, and obviously, you know, Jarrett Patterson's been a really good player. Him getting to the next level is an, is is important and all those kind of things. But Blake Fisher has a chance to be a star, like a genuine star, and, and not like a really good player. Jarrett Patterson can be a really good player. Jarrett Patterson, to me, is never going to be a top 10 NFL draft pick. You're hoping he can be a first-round guy. But, sure. you know, he, he's more Robert Hainsey. He's more – 
you know, Liam Eikenberg right. than he is Quentin Nelson. And that's kind of where I see Blake Fisher potentially being that kind of dominant player. Now, do I expect him to be full go there in 2022? No, because he's a sophomore, right? Right. But right. he should take a jump, right? And and that's going to be the thing for Coach Eastan is, is he's got to be sort of your pet project in that, like, you have another le- a tackle in Joe Walt that you need to work on and get going. But, like, Joe's kind of already – really technically advanced you know there's more you can build on there but no joe came to college knowing how to play thanks to his dad yeah that helps you know and and blake has incredible skills and he's still learning the position and finding you know figuring out what buttons to push for him is going to be key now to me the reason i don't put the relationship into this category because to me that's more on Blake Fisher than it is on Harry Heastan. I don't think that's a task for Blake Fisher or Harry Heastan. That's a task for Blake Fisher. Look, it, it, it's pretty simple. Blake's going to have conversations with former players and they're going to tell him like, look, coach Heastan is, is going to cuss you and get on you and, and all these kind of things. But you know, it'll be the advice that older players gave younger players all the time back in the day. I guarantee you we'll see the Martins and Quentin Nelson and those guys back on campus this summer. And they're going to have conversations with, with Blake Fisher. And it's going to be about, listen, here's how you, how you receive that coaching and turn it into something special. And that's going to be up to Blake to decide because Harry, he stands 63 years old. He is who he is. And his track record speaks for itself. Exactly. If you're not going to let yourself be coached by him, that's a you problem, not a him problem. In my, in, in my opinion. And everybody's like, well, you know, he's got to change. For, no, 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 not on offensive line. I'm sorry. The, the, I, I'm going to put my foot down and say, you can baby a lot of other position groups. You can't baby offensive linemen. Not if you want to be a champion. And if Blake Fisher wants to be a star, if Blake Fisher wants to be an elite player, and I'm not saying he won't be receptive to that coaching. I'm not saying that at all. I think there's a lot of people concerned about it because there are certain perceptions yeah. about Blake Fisher as a I player, that was interesting. which is fine. And, and again, I don't know enough about Blake Fisher to know if he will or won't take the coach he stands coaching. My point, however, is the track record speaks for itself. And if you allow yourself to be coached and pushed and challenged and, and, and you take that on a daily basis, it doesn't mean you have to like it. We've right. said this before. Ronnie Stanley did not like being coached by Harry Heastan from a style standpoint, but Ronnie Stanley took the coaching. He applied the coaching, and it made him a top 10 NFL draft pick and an All-American. And you saw Ronnie uh, tweet yesterday when Harry when the announcement was made about Harry Heastan, Ronnie Stanley tweeted three goats, mm-hmm. right? Meaning, yeah, that's the man. But when he was here, did Ronnie Stanley like it? No. And – you look at Liam Eikenberg, he was someone who was actually kind of happy that Coach Eastan was gone. It's what we were kind of told behind the scenes. Well, when when Liam Eikenberg was going into his final year, who did he turn to to work with him over the summer? Harry Eastan, because he grew up and matured and realized, I and Liam was said this, I didn't take enough of advantage of my time. You know, basically, he didn't say it specifically, but, you know, you knew what he was talking about. Right. And so, to me, if Blake Fisher's willing to take that hard coaching – from Coach Eastan, he's going to realize this is going to make me a lot of money because I don't question Blake Fisher's work ethic. I mean, no one that has been at Notre Dame that has been around this young man and from what I have seen has questioned that. Now, there were people that questioned it before he got here because there are assumptions about kids that look like Blake Fisher because of the big body and he had a little bit of baby fat on him and he's such a big kid. And you say, oh, that guy's going to, you know, you have to, that guy's not going to necessarily be a great hard worker. People just make those assumptions about bigger kids like that. And that was like eliminated day one. Nobody questioned Blake Fisher's work ethic. If he can take the hard coaching, then that combination of his work ethic and talent with Harry Heastan's teaching ability, you've got a chance to have an absolute star. And it could start, it'll start to see it now because let's not forget Quentin Nelson as a sophomore was the 2015 season and he was really good. Right. I mean, we saw it and he didn't play as a freshman. Blake at least got a game and a half under his belt, you know. And so he's going to have the whole spring. He's going to be healthier because fortunately for him and for Notre Dame, his injury happened so early that by the time they get into winter conditioning, he's he's healthy now. And by the time they get into spring, he's going to be full go. 
So I think that's a really, a really important piece to this conversation is you've got to get Blake Fisher playing like a star. And if you can do that, and I don't care if he's a left tackle, right tackle, left guard, right guard, I don't care. Just wherever he's going to play. Right, right. He's got to be a star. I think that's that's the big thing for me. And, and it's – I'll tell you this. I've been told by a couple really good sources. So the people that were telling me that he wasn't wanting to get back into coaching, then the same, were the same people that, that – which is why, how we were able to get it out first – that he was looking to come back. Right. And at first it was, you know, some role. Then it was like, no, he wants to be the coach now. It was watching, I'm told it was watching Joe Alt late in the year and then watching Blake Fisher. And he was like, those kids can be special. And he mm -hmm. wanted to be, he wanted to be the guy that said, like, it, with my tutelage, these kids can be special. And that's just the kid that he kids that he knows, you know, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he what he wants to, what he's thinking once he gets to see Rocco Spindler and Michael Carmody and some right. of these other guys, and maybe he didn't get to see as much, sure. or maybe or more. He guards. probably didn't have access to right. practice film right. and all that at the right. time, which then takes us into our final key point for the offensive line play. Well, and, and again, it, it points to personnel, and it points to find you know maximizing your personnel and where what you have on the depth chart, and specifically. It's who are your guards going to be moving into the 22 season? I, I think at the moment, we know three of the five, right? I mean, we know that uh, Alt and Fisher are going to be at the tackles, at least right now, and Patterson. Well, we know gonna they're going to be somewhere, right? I mean, we think it's going to be and that's, tackle, right. They're going to be starting somewhere. So who are the other two? Let's put it that right. way. Who are the other two guys going to be? Obviously, Christophic is returning. Um, so, you know, he's Josh got Lugg's returning. Josh Lugg right. is returning. Good call. I mean, you have five starters coming back. That is true. Essentially. Yeah. That, that, I and mean, you that have five guys that have started games coming back. Correct. Actually, uh, eight, actually, because Tosh Baker started games last year. Michael Carmi started games last true. year. And Zeke Carell started games. That is I true. Mean, you have eight different guys coming back that have started games in Notre Dame. But again, but even though it's young, right. there's a lot of guys that have played. And you've got you've got a brand new coach who's going to come in and he's going to make his own assessment mm -hmm. uh, along with Chris Watt and they're going to figure out okay who one of the best things that I loved about Harry Heaston when he was here is he was all about take the top five guys and figure out where they go you know what I mean and how are they going mm -hmm. to mesh the best together right. to get the top five guys right. on the field and I, I that's the best strategy I've ever heard from an offensive right. line standpoint right and so right. what is that going to look like. You know, and that's right. going to be the biggest question mark. Well, who are those five going to be? Five or six, right. really? And what is it going to look like? And that's that's going to be his charge moving forward, right? Finding yeah. those top five guys. Like, I feel like there's certain things I assume about the 2022 team. Okay. I assume Jarrett Patterson's going to be pretty good. I assume that Jarrett Patterson's combination of his own talent, his combination of – being healthy, because remember, Jared Patterson got hurt late in 2020, right. missed a lot of the offseason, right, because he was coming back from the foot injury. And lower body injuries are the worst for offensive line. Uh, absolutely. That's where all your power is. Right. Yeah. And and so and I think that's why he was so much better late in the year than he was early in the year. Because if Jared Patterson was going to make an NFL decision off what he was the first five, six games of the year, there's not even a question that he's going to come out. He's definitely coming back. Yeah. He played much better down the stretch because he, I think, he was healthier. Well, now he's going to have a full off season to get stronger and get healthy. And then you look at him with Harry Heastan. Look, Harry Heastan's never had a center with his natural, with Jarrett Patterson's natural God given ability. It's a good point. It was Nick always Martin was yeah. really good. Sam yeah. Mustafer was really good. Yeah. They didn't have his physical tools. Now I'm not saying that he's necessarily better than those guys. He still has a lot to prove to me. But I think that his natural tools are are there jared's gotten by a lot on just athleticism if we're going to be honest the last couple of years so i think he's going to be really good i have a lot of confidence in the tackles sure and we saw him and i mean the, they went up against the nation's best pass rush last year in the bowl game and ha more than held their own mm -hmm. in my opinion i mean joe walt gave up one sack on a which was a covered sack blake fisher gave up one sack and it was like it was an easily correctable mistake but i mean they threw the ball 68 times and, right, and and right. and had more passing. You know, they had at least seventy passing plays. One gave up a cover sack, and one gave up just one pressure that resulted in the sack on the outside. I mean, other than that, those two guys, you know, those those guys, they held up just fine. They did pretty good as yeah. two freshmen. I mean, yeah. one 
one getting a second start bookended on the entire season. I mean, you're talking about, right. you know, September all the way to January right. 1st. You know what I right. mean? That's a so, long time. So I'm confident there. The question for me, the thing that's going to determine whether or not this is going to be a really good offensive line, just a good offensive line or a great offensive line. And it, it, the range is going to be there. Like it's going to at least be good. Yeah. Right. 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 In my opinion, it, you know, good chance is going to be really good, but can it really be like the 15 unit? Can it be like the 17 unit? Can it be like the 12 unit, even though the talent is way better across the board than the 12 unit? Now, again, I'm not saying that any of these guys are Zach Martin. I'm just making the point as a group of five, right. The talent's better. Like maybe, the 2012 line was better at one with Zach Martin because, you know, Blake's got a lot to prove. Jared's got a lot to prove. Je Zach Martin in 2012 is better than anybody that Notre Dame has right now from what they've shown. But three, four, and five talent-wise, I mean, it's not even close. With all due respect to Braxton Cave, Mike Golick Jr., and, and Christian Lombard. I mean, I think I think they would tell you that if you watch the players <laughs> in the current team, right? Right, right. Um, I think that's that's the question. The, 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 the concern, however – the difference between just good and great is going to be the guards yeah and figuring out what's going on there like like with Josh Lug coming back i got major concerns about whether that's not that's the right idea or not but if Josh Lug can be healthy if Josh Lug is able to stay healthy this year he's going to be a good player because as we've said for years he's got to be a guard the injuries have taken away his ability to play in space. He's just not an edge player. Right. If he's going to be we, successful. We said that going into the season, right. though, that his best position right. is guard. Right. Now, I loved him as a tackle coming out of high school, but he's sure. not that guy anymore. Exactly. He can exactly. be a guard. They're going to have to get the most out of him. And if he's not able to be healthy or not able to take his game to another level, then Coach Heastan has to be willing to allow him to be beat out. And can someone beat him out? Left guard, Andrew Kristoffic did a really nice job last year. Not so much so, however, that I think he's just given the job. He's it's anointed in. to him. Yeah, right. You know, I, I and, and if he starts, that's fine. I'm good with that. But he needs to start because he held off and beat out Michael Carmody, who I hope moves to guard. Beat out Rocco Spindler. Beat out Zeke Carell. Guys that I think are going to be better this year than they were in the past. Sure. You know, those, those are the things that I'm looking for is – if solidifying those two positions is going to determine whether this is just a good offensive line or an elite offensive line. And that's, that's the final piece to this puzzle yeah. for, for Harry Heastan and the offensive line. Yeah. And, and we're, we're obviously going to be breaking down the offensive line a lot moving forward. There's still some things I'd like to see happen from a personnel standpoint that, you know, I, I, I would be interested, and I think he, Harry's going to be open to moving guys around if he feels like that's going to be the best thing for the offensive line. Uh, but, yeah, I, it, guard play is going to be very, very interesting yeah. to see who ends up there. Yeah. And it could be a current tackle. I mean, you just never know who that's yeah. going to end up being. So we'll move on to the, the receiver here in a second, but I did want to address Wade's question before we move on. So you go ahead and give that a read, Vince. You betcha, Wade. Thank you for the super chat very much. It says, hey, guys, you've talked about Coach Eastan's coaching style. Is there any concern that the younger guys or recruits may not take well to it? Yeah, there is for me. I, I, I'm concerned about that. It's just it's not two different coaching styles from Quinn to Eastan. Yeah, Let's be I, honest. I'm concerned about whether or not they're going to buy in or sure. not. But it's not a Harry Heastan problem. That's going to be a player problem. You know, do you want to be great? Do you want to be pushed? And, you know, my hope, my hope is that, number one, you do have one guy left on the team who was coached by Harry Heastan for a season, Josh Lug. You're going to have, I'm told that we're going to see Martins, Q, all those guys back on campus this summer at the lineman camps, which they always were when he was still here. Right, exactly. Quentin never was because Quentin was a player, but like Martins always came back. They always came back with Coach, you know, to Chris Watt would always come back and work the summer camps with Coach Heastan. And Ronnie Stanley came back the last couple of years, you know, or at least one of the last couple of years. Right. So you're going to have those guys back. I think they're going to be able to give some words of wisdom. You're going to have Chris Watt there who played for Harry Heastan for two seasons, who's going to be able to say, hey, listen, guys and i think that's a big important piece to chris watt coming back mm -hmm. is that's a guy that played for harry he stand yeah and here's the thing right. if you've ever met chris watt he's not a real imposing guy you don't meet him and think oh former nfl offensive lineman he ain't a real big guy 
the reason that's important is because he's going to say, hey, guys, l- look at me. You know, like I was a third round NFL draft pick. You know, I took my talent that I had and I allowed myself to be pushed by Coach Eastan. And it and that combination, you know, helped me be part of some really good football teams. You know, in 2012, we went to the national title game in 2013. You know, we were second in the nation and only giving up eight sacks. We were one of the best lines in the country that year and what they were asked to do. And, you know, he can be sort of the he stand whisperer. You know, and that's, that's that some key. of the veterans going to be the go between. Yeah, I think right. a lot. He needs to be, that needs to be part of and his the coach. Role. Yeah, exactly. Because right. he's closer in their age, and you know, he that always whole, needs to have Coach yeah. E stand back. And it's not about it's okay. It's right. more about hey, man. You know, he can be that veteran presence of saying, "Hey, listen to what he's saying, not how he's saying." Exactly. Because that's what the veterans would he's always the tell the younger guys. There was yeah. always that buffer of hey, yep. you know, listen, it's going to be all right. So it's imperative that number one that I would hope the coach he stand would just let him know, hey guys, listen. I mean, he needs to be the one to say that because he didn't recruit these guys. It's kind of like when I got back into coaching, my wife, you know, was a great coach's wife, but it was hard on her. I know mean, it was hard on her, and it was kind of like part of the reason I got out was she didn't sign up for that, right? Like she didn't sign up to be a coach's right. wife. That's right. something that came later, right? And and. To me, that is that is kind of where with this is these kids didn't sign up to play for Harry He stands. It's a very good okay? point. He needs to sit down and say, Hey, listen, you guys did not sign up for what you're about to get through. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna ride you, I'm gonna be hard on you, I'm gonna be demanding, I'm gonna probably throw some pins and stuff across the room. I'm gonna cuss you, but here's the thing: you gotta listen to what that's just how I am, guys. I'm 63 years old, I'm not changing who I am. Exactly. Okay. But if you if you stick with me, if you understand where I'm coming from, if you this, if you that, I promise you, I'm going to make you the best version of who you can be. Uh, and then and then when that's reinforced by Chris Watt, by Zach Martin, right. by Nick Martin, by Robert Hainsey, by Quentin Nelson, by those guys, then it'll be easier to take. And I hope the coach E stand does that. I'm not asking Coach E stand to change. He shouldn't change. I'm asking him to say maybe you need to adjust the manner in which you go about preparing them for who you are going to be. That's what I think he can change is because he didn't recruit these kids, you know, and, and they are a young group. He inherited sure. kind of a veteran group in 2012. I mean, Zach Martin was a senior. Watt was a senior. They ended up being fifth years the next year, but you know, um, Bra- Mike Golick Jr. was a fifth year senior, I believe in 2012. Braxton Cave was a senior. I mean, he, he inherited a pretty young group. It was just Christian Lombard was really the only young guy that he had. Ronnie Stanley was the other. This is a much younger group than one he inherited. Right. So I, I do hope he has that conversation, Wade. And I am concerned about the players taking it because it's just the unknown. But I think at the end of the day, there's going to be enough there that they're going to understand because there is and a I track think, record, though. Like yeah, you know what I mean. Right. Like there, there's a massive track record for what he's done at Notre Dame right. and and putting guys in the NFL. Right. And look, these guys aren't coming to Notre Dame without produ- aspirations. Right. right. Blake Fisher wants to be a. I mean, yeah. you don't think Blake Fisher, as good as he is, thinks he's a top ten NFL draft? I hope he does. Right. But then be willing to work to earn it. And I think that's exactly. what's that's what's gonna. But people, I think, are gonna learn about Blake is. I do think this kid wants it. He's not just talented. I do think he wants it. Now we're going to see if he's willing to 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 you know to play with that and and, and embrace that coaching. So, um, Wade, I think that's a legitimate concern. I, I I do. I think, but I think it's going to end up being okay because Harry Heastan's done this before. You know, the, the, his coaching style is a lot harder than Jeff Quinn's, but it's also a lot harder than Ed Warner's. And that 2012 group embraced it. Yeah. You say, oh, kids are different. Eh, I don't know how different offensive linemen are. Yeah, I was going to say. At least not the kids that Notre Dame is. I mean, these are a bunch of northern kids right. for the well, most part. Offensive linemen are a different. Yeah. Group. It, yeah. It, it, they we're not are. They're tougher. Receiver. We're not talking They tend about, to be tougher, mentally, yeah, physically right. tougher kids. Yeah, absolutely. You know, look, Andrew Kristoffik's from Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. He's been cussed at before. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, Blake Fisher's from Indianapolis. He's been cussed at before. You know, you, you, you get me, Vince? I mean. Absolutely. Michael Carmody enough said right i mean right. Th- i'm not concerned about that to be honest with you the question is can can he can he does he still have that magic touch that's what we're going to find out i believe he does yeah. but that's what we're going to find out so yeah now vince 
Let's transition to the wide receiver position. Yes, absolutely. Because this one is – we've talked about – I mean, if, if you're going to rank the position groups that we've talked about coaching-wise over the last year to two years, uh, I think it goes offensive line and then wide receiver um, as far as issues that we've had, you know, with, with the coaching and the, the the play and the, you know, all of that. So we've got – New a new coach at wide receiver. It's Chancey Stuckey. He he was just introduced yesterday as well. Uh, along already with, on the road recruiting, already on the road recruiting, which is fantastic. Uh, we we feel like that's probably a, a good place for him and recruiting wise. So, what does he need to do walking into the door? Because this is a different situation than yeah. walking in the door at offensive line. This is walking in the door <laughs> at wide receiver, where you've got eight scholarship receivers, two of which are injured right now as well. Yeah, and and look, he's got a big test in front of him, right? Yes. But I do think he has talent to work with. I think I think that's the thing. I was told by a, a couple sources actually that one of the things that the the coaches that interviewed kind of observed when they watched the film of Notre Dame players was like, "Wow, these guys don't know how to play." <laughs> like I was told that by multiple sources that, that that know multiple of the guys that interviewed for the job. Yeah, and, and so I think that there's a misconception on the talent level that this group has. Because they weren't taught how to play. I mean, <clears throat> you watch the national title game. You watch, you know, I watched the Kansas City Buffalo game, and I'm watching Gabriel Davis, who went to UCF, just literally spinning guys into the ground. And I'm like, that's how you're supposed to play the game. Now, exactly. there's certain things you do as an NFL player you can't do as a college player. But Notre Dame is so far away from where you can be as a college team. And that's really where this begins with Chancey Stuckey. The number one thing he has to do – the minute he arrives from a team standpoint is get back to basics. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many little things that they just don't do well. Getting in a stance, proper spacing, getting off the line versus press. Just, I mean, again, these are like day one these install high, things look, for a receiver's honest, coach. Use attacking leverage. I mean, it's advanced <clears throat> high school stuff, but some it's of high it is. Stuff. Yeah. Some of it is a lot yeah. of it. The stuff I just said is but yeah. like, Attacking yes. leverage, you know, being able to man manipulate top ends. Those are things that are that shouldn't be considered next level stuff. Right. Absolutely. I mean, those should be relatively basic things. You know, like when I remember watching it was the 2019 game against USC, Chase Claypool runs a post route. He's got Isaac Taylor Stewart just flat beat, you know, just because he's faster than him and he just kind of drifts to the post. Well, Isaac Taylor Stewart is never threatened and he just kind of runs with him. And the ball hangs up and he's able to make it where just one little stick, one little lean stick, and he's open and it's a 50, 60 yard gain. Like those little things are the difference against good opponents between an incompletion and a 50, 60 yard gain. That's what people don't understand about this. And what 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 gets me so dang frustrated is you're so focused on scheme and you just do these same dumb drills every single day. It's like you're not teaching these kids how to play. And it was so – it was just across the board. I mean, the only guy that I felt was a really good technical player last two years is a former quarterback. Quarterbacks tend to be more focused on those type of things. And and if you ask me, that's something he learned back home, not at Notre Dame, because he, what Avery Davis did was so different than what everybody else did. Yeah. And, and I'm going back five years, you know, and, and so – the technical improvement is the biggest task in front no of question. Chancey Stuckey, and it's the basics. I mean, and you and you've got to like, you've got to like, it's like going to boot camp. You've got to like erase almost everything that these guys have learned. See, I, I'm going to disagree with that, Vince. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of deep programming that has to happen because they weren't doing stuff. <laughs> they weren't doing anything to begin with. Like, I mean, it's not like, hey, you were doing top ends incorrectly. You just weren't doing top ends. Yeah, right, right, and and the few and again. If you look at the who's the player the last two years that had the most separation on vertical type routes, it was Avery Davis. I think of the Purdue route. I think of the Clemson route last year. And those were well-executed top ends. We just never saw that with anybody else. And he was able to lean, stick, and all of a sudden he's beasting Clemson on a big play, a, a playoff team, right? We hardly ever saw that kind of stuff from the receivers. I mean, so you're not deprogramming anything. It's like they just you're you're you need to, to teach them how to practice. This you need to, to teach you. them how to do all the yes. little things. Yeah, this absolutely. matters to you. Nothing's yeah. more important than this. If you don't do this, you can't play for me, right? If you don't take your stance and start 
seriously, if you don't, if you don't right. work hard to master your your craft against press, because look, as more and more teams go man coverage, you're going to see more and more press. And the way that Notre Dame played the last couple of years, especially in 2021, because they didn't have like Javon McKinley and like Ben Skoranek was taught how to play receiver at Northwestern. Okay, not at Notre Dame. No, Javon McKinley was just kind of bigger. He could just out muscle guys. He kind of like had that Chase Claypool, Mal- Chase say, Claypool, Miles Boykin cool. thing. Yeah, exactly. He didn't really have that. Kevin Austin's not that kind of strong player. At least he doesn't know how to use it. And the other thing too is Javon learned a lot of that stuff in high school. And that stuff Javon was doing back at Centennial, right. which is why he was so which dominant. Is what made him such a highly ranked recruit right. coming out? Yeah. And, and so his thing was just finally staying healthy was his big thing, mm-hmm. and staying out of you know staying out of some trouble. Right. So when I look at the receiver position, Vince, it's like, look, you've got to take this seriously. You have to be, I, in my opinion, no position, no skill position in football in today's game requires more attention to detail and, and really respecting the craft more than receiver, in my opinion. And, I, and I'll give an example. It's not that those things aren't important in the secondary, but a friend of mine asked me this. We're talking about Cooper Cup. And he's like, man, Cooper Cup's really fast. I was like, no, he's not really. He ran a yeah. four six something at the combine. He's right. not that fast. Yeah, Cooper Cup plays fast, right? Because His he know he is a master, man, right? And you watch, like you watch guys like him. You watch. I remember, like when I grew up, I told you this, Vince. When I was a receivers coach, when I was coming up, my first year as a receivers coach, I spent that whole offseason studying Curtis Johnson who's now at the Saints, but he was coaching Santana Moss and Reggie Wayne, and I had a lot of practice of his practice film. And I'm watching these Santana Moss and Reggie Wayne run routes, and I'm thinking, these guys are flipping masters of route running. Like, yes, they're athletically gifted, but they are right. – Reggie Wayne was not a 4'3 a guy. Marvin Harrison was fast, but, I mean, I, you look at these, these guys over their careers, like Jerry Rice was a master at how to play the position. He wasn't dominant off of – you know, four two speed things like that, and when you look at that position, you see the the debate we were having about Cooper Cup was you can do that. You cannot. You can be a four six skill player at receiver. If Cooper Cup played defense, he's not an NFL player. Meaning, not, now again, I'm not saying transitioning to defense. I'm saying if an athlete like Cooper Cup comes along and he plays defense, more often than not, he can't play because at the end of the day. Technique's important, but you either can run or you can't on defense. At receiver, you can be more of a precision guy that maybe you can play beyond your skill set. Michael Thomas for the Saints is an example. He wasn't a real fast guy. DeAndre Hopkins ran a four six something, right? But these guys are master craft people, man. Right, right. And that's what allows them to be successful. You don't have I me. Mean, look at Cooper Cup. He gets. I'm, I'm, I was watching the game on Sunday. I don't watch a lot of NFL, but I watched. The weekend, this weekend's games and the Saturday games, like, oh, there are some good games, like boring. Sunday's games were great, and I'm watching Cooper Cup, and I'm like, I knew he was really good. I've seen the stats, and I've you know I've seen like workout tapes of his, but I'm lo- asking myself like, are they just not covering him? <laughs> like, how's he this wide open all the time? <laughs> and then they show the play, and you're like, oh yeah, there you go. Look at that stem. Look how he leaned the guy. Look how, and I'm just like, man, He's this just is the like, master I'm of just, craft. I'm I mean, just it's... like getting tears in my eyes because I'm like being, you know, remembering what it's like to watch guys that know how to run routes. And and my point is that's what I've been saying about Alabama for years and Ohio State for years is not only are they great athletes, but those guys are also master craft people. And and that's where Notre Dame needs to get to. Chris Olave is not, probably not going to go run a 4-3 at the Combine, but he knows how to play. I doubt Garrett Wilson runs a 4-3 at the Combine, but, man, he knows how to play. They know how to get open. And that's been missing in Notre Dame. And nothing is more important than that. Teach these kids how to play. Now, beyond that, there's some other things like, you know, one of the, the things that we had, Vince, was like, you got to be better pass catchers, right? You got to yeah. know how to fight for the ball. There's technical things involved. Remember last week we were talking about receiver play and we talked about how the how, catch and roll, you know, catch and roll. And you saw that in the playoff yep. game this yep. weekend. A couple times, more than like one. A way more than play one. Yeah. Where a guy catches and he roll. You have yeah. to teach that. Right. Right, that's not something that 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 just you do automatically. Maybe some guys do. You practice that. Yeah, right. And and to me, there's things you do. So like I've talked about accelerating through the comeback, and I've talked about you know there's drills that we would do in practice. And again, this is Division three and Division one AA guys, right? These aren't you know a couple of my guys got NFL you know invites, but neither of them made teams. But like 
you practice when you're running a fade route against press coverage to go, to jump straight up for the ball, right? You're never going to be able to run full speed and jump, stop and jump yeah, straight up for the, the ball. The gravity right? gets involved. But you yeah. work on that and you practice that because when they do jump and they drift, they're not drifting as bad, which means – because like the, the Virginia play with Braden Lindsay, perfect example. Braden jumps, but he jumped and he just kept going. Well, the DB never really hit him. The DB was just in front of the ball and, you know, was able to break the ball up. If Braden were, it was worked every, like every week, we would work on this. Like once or twice a week, we would work on this during warm up, where you're teaching him to jump up because what happens is he has a better, if you jump up, then I can, I have a better opportunity to reach beyond you, right? Which like Michael Mayer did against in the Virginia game. The other part is if I if I'm able to jump more up, even though I'm gonna have a little bit of a drift, but not as much of a drift, that guy is gonna run through me when I go back for the ball. And if I'm making a play for the ball and he runs through me, That's if I don't make the catch, PI. it's still PI. Yeah. But you'd see the Notre Dame players kind of drift real bad, and so it would never force the DB to run through them, and so they weren't able to draw the PIs. Right. Those are things you teach every yep. single week. You work on them, and, and and when they're out on their own in the summer, they work on it every day. In the season, you mix up like Tuesday, you have your drills, Wednesday, you have your drills, Thursday, you have your drills, right? Like you mix those things up. You can't do all of them every single day, but that's because the season is more about keeping those things refined, not adding them. You add them in the spring, you add them in the summer, right? And no, none of those things were taught. And, and right. those are all about competing for the football. When I watch Baylor's film, I'm going to have something here in the next week, uh, you know, as I continue working through the film. I'm going to have some stuff on the premium message board, some video clips and some breakdowns kind of going through what I see from the Baylor film, but they compete for the football so much better than the Notre Dame receivers. Yeah. And, and that's a big thing too, is I saw, I think it was like what the receivers alone corner pro football focus had a, about a, a little over a 50% completion rate, rate on contested balls at Baylor at Notre Dame. It was like 37, something like that. No one can tell me that anyone on Baylor's roster is better than Kevin Austin. <laughs> and I guarantee you none of them run like Braden Lindsay. You, you know what I mean? Like right. the talent, it's not a talent problem. It's those kids know how to play the game. Notre Dame's kids don't. To me, at the end of the day, those are vitally important things. No question. Vitally important things. No question. So let's let's talk about the the depth chart a little bit, the actual guys that he's going to be working with, you know. One of the first things he needs to work on, or not work on, but one of the first things he, he needs to to assess is the the sophomores, right? You've got mm -hmm. three sophomores who are going to be really, really, really important well, because that's yeah. your, those are your veterans in the spring. I don't think I don't think he needs to assess. Here's your assessment, Coach Stuckey. They're really good. Okay, <laughs> assessment done. Coach them up. The, the key is coaching them up. Yeah, right. Coach them up. And, and Lorenzo will be easy, right? Lorenzo will be easy. He works. Everyone yeah. that I've ever talked about Lorenzo said the kid works. And he showed up at Notre Dame sort of ahead of the game, right? He showed up at Notre Dame with, you know, so for him it's about just – it's about refining. You know, he's he, he arrived here with some natural sure. ability of running routes and understanding those type of things. Now it's about really teaching him the finer points of position. Deion Colsey's kind of a big, raw ball of clay. Number one, as I've said before, he's about a year old, younger than the rest of the guys in his grade. He's still just a baby. He's 6'4", 200 plus, and he played against not great competition. Dion thinks he works hard because he's so natural that he's just been able to dominate with what he's done. I think what Coach Stuckey needs to get him to realize is, hey, man, you're not anywhere close to being the player you can be. And I'm not saying that to insult you. I'm saying that to push you because if you ever get close to the player you can be or become the player you can be, you're going to be a star, you know? And, and it's, it's about, he's the one to me more than the other two, Jaden Thomas and Lorenzo Styles is important. Sure. But to me, his, his yeah. biggest task is getting Dion ready. Yeah. Because here's the other thing. If Lorenzo goes down, you've got some other guys that can play Lorenzo's position. You've got Joe Wilkins, you've got Braden Lindsay, you've got Avery Davis, you've got, uh, you've got Tobias Merriweather. We have another, maybe another guy that we'll get to. You don't really have anybody else on the roster that has what Deion Colsey has. Six foot, 200 plus, six four, 200 plus, right. super long arms, 
that natural boundary guy. Yeah, and I, they don't because Tobias isn't a natural boundary guy. I think if anything, Tobias is more of a natural X receiver. He can be a boundary guy, but he's like buck eighty five right now. Sure, nobody else is that natural boundary with right. the way that Notre Dame plays the boundary. Right, right. And I feel like he of all the guys on this roster. Because he did get a little bit of time, you know, during 2021, a little bit. And he, to me, he just looked lost. Like he looked, and that's coaching to me. That That's not him. I'm not. Like the and, interception against Virginia Tech. He had no yeah, clue what he was doing. He had no idea. None. It's like he was just out there. You know right. what I mean? And I don't blame him for that. He was coaching. thrust into the situation. Right. And wasn't prepared you need to be for prepared. success. He exactly. wasn't prepared for success. And so you're right. Big ball of clay is a perfect analogy for him. Because I feel like it's a blank slate. Yeah. Like you, you've got all this talent. Yeah. You've got the physical measurements. You've got all and of that. From what I'm told, Dion wants to work. Dion wants go. to be great. Yes. He wants to be good. I don't think it's right. a work problem for Dion. It's about are you arming him with the tools to be great? And taller receivers to me need even more technical work because it's a little, it's not natural. The things that I taught as a receiver weren't natural for a 6'4 guy. Right. So you had to kind of nuance it a little sure, bit because I couldn't ask a 6'4 guy to be as precise and sharp with his cuts as a 6'2 guy or a 5'11 right. guy. That's what makes Tobias somewhat unique because Tobias does kind of have that. But Dion's like the typical – Chase Claypool's never going to run routes the way that Cooper Cup does or the way that Marvin Harrison did or the way that Santana Moss or – Two completely yes, different com- body styles. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Body types are way yeah. different. Yeah. The athletic skill is different. It's It's – teaching him how to do certain things, right? And that's what they got to do with Dion because I think Dion's got a chance to be a star. So no that doubt. is certainly one of the biggest tasks. Another one is he's got to figure out a way to get Brayden Lindsay going. And you and I both Bra- had that one. Brayden Lindsay now. is a guy <laughs> that has talent to be a difference maker. Yes. But Brayden has never been taught how to play the game. I feel like they've only scratched the surface of what he can do for you within the offense. Yes, we've talked about reverses and all of those different things that you can do. But he just needs to be coached up on the fundamentals of being a receiver. I mean, just doing the little things of being a receiver. And if he can do those, all of a sudden his game takes another step right. as well. And you can have him. You don't just have to have him on the field for your gadget plays. You can have him on the field for some other things as well. And I, I, right. and I don't think that that's a tough transition to make. You know what I mean? Like, it's again, it's, it's a lot of fundamental play. And if he's involved in that in the spring when there's, the numbers are going to be so low and it's going to be a lot of one-on-one opportunities – uh, and I'm talking one-on-one with the coach, I think he can get there. I think he can take his game to another level. But you and I both had written down, Lindsey, I, I, I think, what did I write exactly? I said, Lindsey into a wide receiver. Like right, right now, Lindsey's a skill player. Right. He's, he's not a, a He's a track guy, still trying yeah, to play football. That's exactly right. He If they can turn him into a receiver, all yeah. of a sudden the offense takes another step as well. And for me, I... I... I don't think Braden recognizes how little he's been coached. The last <laughs> Probably years. not. I hope that he understands that. I hope that Braden hears what we're saying and understands that. I don't, uh, I watch Braden Lindsay play and I'm like, this kid has no idea how to play football. Like you watch him get off press. Like he thinks he can just run around a guy. That's stuff he did in high school and he could exactly. run around. You're just better guys. than everybody else. Right. Yeah. And, and that's a, the excitement for me is, you know, we saw Braden stay healthy this year. It was a great sign. You hope now that he's matured, physically matured, maybe he's passed some of that stuff now that his body's – because what can happen is, you know, you go from like 18 to 20, that's your fine – a lot of guys, that's kind of your final, you know, your body evolution, right? Which. And when you're when you're growing or you're going through some different things, you know, you, you can maybe be more susceptible, but then as you get older, your body's kind of settled in and, and some guys get – some guys never get past it. Some guys do. Maybe Braden did. Maybe they found a better way to handle his workload, right? Maybe that was the thing. They handled his workload better, which is something we said that they should do. But to me, the thing that they were missing is they never taught Braden how to be successful. He does. He doesn't really understand how to get off routes. He doesn't. I mean, it's so important for a guy like him because if he if he becomes a master, like if if I could give him a master's degree in route running, you know, like if 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 he hired me to be his trainer over the summer i would put him through the master class of route running yeah right and he would just be dominant next year on 40 touches because right Right. him running a slant route and getting a step on a guy when he catches it is the difference between an eight yard catch and an 80 yard touchdown right him understanding how to win at the line of scrimmage if Braden lindsey knew how i've never seen him win at the line of scrimmage the right way against anyone good 
if he knew how to win at the line of scrimmage, all of a sudden he's hitting bombs, exactly. right? Yep. If he knew how yep. to properly execute certain routes, he's going to get the ball in space more. And then that makes the Jets and the reverses so much more effective. And, and that's my thing is if Braden says, you know what, man, forget all this other stuff. I'm coming back and I'm going to do what I need to do to be the best technical player I can be. Right. Don't rely on your speed anymore. Pretend I let's tell Braden Lindsay, pretend you're slow. Right. This offseason, pretend right. you're slow. Right. Pretend you're a four six and tell yourself, I'm slow. I gotta learn how to get open. Because if he can convince himself of that, and I'm not, you know, you don't want him to be you know, it, 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 you understand the, the point that I'm making. Right? I do, yes. Is prepare like you're slow. Right. Meaning I have to be great with my technique. I have to be good with my – I have to understand how to manipulate defenders and get them to go where I want them to go. I have to understand the importance of doing this, this, and this, and this. And then if he can learn those things and take those things to heart and then apply it to his 4-4 four, four speed, he's a big play guy. And, and that's the thing that I'm saying about Braden is he's got to become that kind of player. Absolutely. And if he could become that kind of player – then I think he's going to have a chance to be a big time player for Notre Dame. Again, not big. He's not going to be Will Fuller, 76 catches. And that's just not the workload. I think his body's capable of handling, but he can touch the ball 40 to 50 times. He can in the still run be and a pass game and be a thousand yard game. guy. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's no doubt. And, right. and so that's what I want to see Braden do. And then my final one, Vince, if oh, I'm yeah. Chancey Stuckey, my final oh, task my. is I'm rec- my biggest recruit, my number one recruit right now, if I'm Chancey Stuckey, is not anyone in the 2023 class. He's already it's not on the anyone roster. in the transfer portal. It's the kid wearing number 26 on the other side of the ball. Yep. I'm yep. recruiting Xavier Watts. And I'm holding and, up the number two jersey that he used to have yep. and be like, this one's lonely. Yep. Like, you know, I, and I, I wrote down fight for X. Like, that's yep. what I wrote down prior to the show because yep. I know that you have said uh, that it's his decision, right? right. It's Xavier Watts' decision whether to stay on defense. As it should be. Or, or what offense. As much as they've jerked him around, it should be yeah. his decision. And, but you need to fight for him, man. Yeah. Like, I'm in his ear every time I see him. I'm shooting him text messages. I'm doing whatever I have to do to get him over to offense. Yeah. And be like, dude, we can be special. You're going to play here. for me. You're yeah. going to be special over here, and you're going to get he's all He's going to get a attention. ton of reps in the spring Absolutely. because there's nobody else there. Exactly. Yeah. And he's going to shine on right. offense because I, and I still believe, look, he can be a really, really good safety. It's no question. Right. I think he could be a an elite off uh, offense. I, I I believe so. Yeah. I yeah. believe he could be. I still think that for the NFL, his best position would be the receiver. Yeah. For the too. reasons we talked about before, Xavier's a really good athlete. He's not a four three guy. He's not a four four two guy. He's more of a four five guy that's really athletic. You know, right. those guys fit better as we've talked about in the National Football League as receivers than they do defensive backs in my opinion. I mean, if Cole Beasley can be an NFL receiver, and this isn't a shot on Cole Beasley, it's just like, he's not big. He's not right. a 4-3 guy. Right. He Man, he knows how to play the game, right? And and that's kind of the thing for me is I think Xavier can can be a really good football player, and and it would be my number one priority would be to convince him yes. of doing that. And that that's uh, by far my number one priority from a personnel yeah. standpoint, from a number standpoint, from yeah. all of these different things. And if somebody ever accidentally drops, you know, uh, Chancey Stuckey's number into my phone, like I'm yeah. texting coach and be like, dude, have you talked to, have you talked yeah. to Xavier today? And yeah. then the next day, have you talked to Xavier today? Like that's, yep. that, that's your number one yep. priority. No question about no it. No doubt. No doubt. That's absolutely. And John A1 with a super chat. Thanks, John. Is Watts a top three wide receiver talent on the current roster? I think he can be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just God given talent. Yes. I yes. I think he's got more talent than they've From a raw just, talent, from a yeah, raw talent perspective. Yeah. Absolutely. Now it's again, just, I don't I, I think that time. I would say he's third or fourth in that conversation. I mean, you Deion, I mean, Deion Colsey and Tobias have things you just can't teach Xavier Watts and Lorenzo Styles, and that's being six four. Right. You know, Lorenzo's in that conversation, Xavier's in that conversation. There's no doubt. I mean, I like I said before, if you're going into the 2023 season. And your top four receivers are Deion Colsey, Lorenzo Styles, Tobias Merriweather, and Xavier Watts. Good luck defenses. Right. You know what exactly. I mean? You're going to need it. And, and that's my whole thing is he can play for you. I mean, look, because you're young, you don't necessarily have to have any of those guys be the guy. Right. Give me a rotation of five, six guys that have their roles and make sure they're getting there. Some weeks Xavier may get more touches. Another week it may be Zay, it may be Lorenzo, Dion, or whatever. You know, and I think the, 
Xavier's unique in that he can play all three of those positions. Yes, exactly. You know, and exactly. and, and to me that's adds he could value be a, as well. He could be a matchup nightmare. He, yeah. he could be. You find you find where he best matches up game you, to game. You can go with your speed unit. Right, you know, and and they need to have this. So like you yell speed, speed, or you know you give it lightning or whatever, and nice you put your NASCAR, your three you know, fast yeah. guys, right? NASCAR, whatever. Yeah. You put Xavier in the boundary, Avery in the slot, Lorenzo to the field, right? And then maybe the next series you go with a bigger group, and you've got Tobias and Dion and Xavier's in the slot, right? I mean, right. there's all t- and then if you put Lorenzo and Dion on the field together, they can switch between slot and outside. So, um, you know that that would be my thing. And so again, when you talk about a group that lacks depth, a group that lacks ball you know ball in hand playmaking ability you've got a guy on your roster that can be that he's playing safety right now that's my number one recruit right right yep. and and and, no and that's what you need to do because Xavier is still going to have a little bit of a bitter taste in his mouth from how he was treated by the previous group you know yeah. and yeah. so to me I got to make him feel the love. There's no other way you're going to convince him. It's not just, oh, we think you can play here. It's like, dude, it's going to you're it's going to have to be recruiting him again. Yeah. That's exactly. what you have to do. And and I still believe that's his best position. I I, I and Me too. that doesn't mean he can't play defense and that's not to saying that at all. He yeah. Is. No, I think he'd be I think, really good safety. Yeah. I yeah. think the kid could just be a special special receiver. So that would be the thing for me. So Vince, we went a little long on the two offensive guys. So we're now, we now know what part of our topic will be on Thursday. Yes. We'll talk about coach Washington and we will talk about coach Mason on Thursday along with some other things. But uh, you know, I thought this was a really interesting conversation. And I, and the reason I want to focus Fun. so much on these two is because the offense is still the group that has to raise its level of play. If Notre Dame is going to compete for a title and there's going to be all the excuses that people are going to lay out for why they shouldn't be a great offense next year. Oh, the quarterback and blah, blah. You know, look, Bright. Hey, look, let me tell you something right now. Tyler Buckner has a lot more playing experiences going into his sophomore year than Bryce Young had last year. He had True. three times as many yards, six times as many touchdowns as a freshman than Bryce Young had. Okay. Don't tell me he doesn't have enough experience. Now, is he going to play well? We don't know that. But in today's era, inexperience isn't an excuse anymore for not having a great offense, okay? Right. You've got talent at receiver. You've got the best tight end in college football, in my opinion. You just hired one of the best offensive line coaches in college football, and you returned eight guys that have started at least two games of college football, right? So the talent is there, and John A. Wins, and he more experience than C.J. Stroud. C.J. Stroud threw zero passes of freshman at Ohio State in 2020. Right. Zero. So to me, the talent is there. It's got to be coached. It's got to be nuanced. You've got to build around it. The talent is there, and that's the task that Harry Heastan and Chancey Stucky have. John McNulty's a good tight ends coach. Tommy Reese is going to get even better in year three than he was in year two, in my opinion. That's just the natural evolution of a young coach. He's going to keep getting better if he's, especially if he's open uh, to to realizing there's another level for me as a coach. Okay, and so to me, when I look at it. I say the offensive staff is going to be the key to the two. More than D coordinator, more than anything else, Chancey Stuckey and Harry Heastand, to me, could be that final, those two final pieces to this thing. And if they are what we hope they are and think they are, then we're going to see the offense take that big jump. And that's what I'm excited to see. And that's, you know, what I'm hoping to see. And, and I can't wait to the spring to, to start to see that first group because the town is there. So, Vince, that's going to be it for today. And we will – uh uh, we will uh, take us out of here. Yep, absolutely. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, the, hit the uh, the notification bell, and share with your friends and family our wonderful podcast that we have going on here. And uh, make sure you hit that like button, everybody, because I know we got a lot of people watching, which is awesome, but make sure you hit that like button. Really would appreciate that as well. So for Brian, I'm Vince, and we will talk to you next time on the Irish Breakdown Podcast. <laughs>